in Star Trek. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our weekly uh, Zach seminar. It's uh, my big pleasure to introduce uh, Udi Khrushchevsky from Jerusalem and uh, from Oxford. And Udi will talk about all the new results in the model theory of finite fields. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, after I wrote this abstract, I realized that the time will really only permit one thing. So I'm really going to uh, aim uh, for uh, these new results. Um, so the way it's going to be structured is like this. Uh, first, there's one line. The first topic will be classical model theory of uh, finite fields, of pseudo-finite fields. So I will uh, describe that first and the ingredients that we're going to need, which includes the measure theory of Chatsidakis, Van der Gries, and McIntyre, and also the difference field point of view. Then there's a completely new section two, completely independent, which is the absolutely fundamental result in combinatorics, uh, the Semeredi uh, regularity lemma that he proved uh, along the way to studying arithmetic progressions in uh, large sets of integers, but after that it became central and well, it became used in many, many things. Uh, later it got generalized, uh, a model theory would say from binary to nary relations, uh, and only I'll discuss that too a little bit. So these are two completely separate lines. Now, uh, Terry Tao combined them. So many of the interesting graphs you might start with are graphs that are interpretable in finite fields. So you have a family of finite fields and the same definition in each one. Um, a Paley graph is a well-known example of that. And um, in that case, you can ask whether you can get better results than just results about arbitrary graphs. And indeed, uh, Tao got qualitative bet better results uh, in ways that I will describe. But he did that for the old, for the analog of the old semi regularity level. And the new results by uh, Elad Levy and uh, Alex Chevalier in their PhDs, respectively, at the Hebrew University, that was already about five years ago, getting a partial result. And just this year uh, at Oxford, um, they were able to uh, generalize Tau's uh, theorem to the general case, to uh, Enery relations. And there's a twist to it. I mean, there's an interesting algebra geometric flavor to the statement that you have to make uh, in the general case. So I hope I'm going to get to, to that. Uh, yeah, and please do interrupt me uh, with questions. Um, okay, so the first topic is um, pseudo-finite fields. And um, no, sorry, uh, I see, sorry, sorry. So this is just a list of uh, uh, sections. Um, okay, so I, I basically said it. Uh, there's going to be a purely algebra geometric, there's going to be two analogs. There's going to be a strict generalization of Tau's theorem, but on the way to that, there's going to be a purely algebraic geometric statement, just about varieties, nothing else, which is from some optic an analog of the Semeredi and higher Semeredi dilemmas. And uh, I hope to get to discuss them and to show that how they actually quite easily imply the generalization of Tau's theorem. Okay. So this is chapter one um, about pseudo-finite fields. And what is a pseudo-finite field? It's a field that for every first order sentence that is true in every large finite field, that sentence is also, also true in K. Uh, in particular, by the way, it should be an infinite field because to say that the field has more than six elements is true in every large enough finite field or more than a hundred elements. Um, well, what does it mean for people who are not familiar with sentences? What kind, what does it mean a sentence which is, and what kind of sentences are true in every large finite field? Okay, one kind of sentence which is true in every field is that it's perfect. So 
what you have to do is for every prime p separately, you have to say that if p equals zero, if your characteristic is zero, then every x is a p-th root. Okay, so that's easy. That's the first order statement. And it tells you we're only looking at perfect fields. And here's another one, which is a bit more complicated. Again, you have to say it separately for each degree. And for every plane curve of degree d, you have to say, if it's irreducible, so you quantify over the parameters, if it's irreducible, this equation is irreducible, then it has a solution. So this is again a first order thing that you can say, I'm skipping over how to express that it's irreducible over the algebraic closure, but okay, the model theoretic words is that in algebraically closed fields, we have an easier quantify elimination. If, so the question of irreducibility can be stated um, without quantifiers. Okay, so this is uh, a first order sentence. That's all I, why I've explained so far. Why is it true? So it's true in sufficiently large finite fields by Vey's Riemann hypothesis for curves. Uh, so we know in fact that if you call this curve C, then the number of points in FQ is approximately Q uh, up to some factor like that. And therefore for large enough fields, it's true. So these fields are called PAC, uh, pseudo algebraic closed. And uh, a third thing which you can say, and it's true in every finite field, is that there's a unique field extension of order n. Um, so how would you say that this, well, a field extension of order n, you can think of it as being on k to the n, and you're looking at bilinear maps from kn uh, to kn. So they're given by some tensor, or if you like, by n matrices. Um, and so, okay, so you can quantify, you can say for all n tuples of matrices like this, if they define <coughs> an associative uh, extension with non zero divisors, uh, well, first of all, there exists one that does that. And secondly, any two differ by GLN. So GLN acts on the family of all such things and there's a unique orbit. So this is something you can express. Um, but in fact, for our purposes, even though it doesn't change anything, we will just view all the finite extensions of the field, you know, which pretends to be a finite field, we'll view all these finite extensions as just having almost the same status as K itself. They just sit there and you're allowed to look at them, to quantify over them, um, and so on. Okay, so this is interpretable, so it doesn't make any difference, but I will just, give predicates, unit predicates, if you like, for the KNs. Beyond that, I'm going to fix a generator of these automorphism groups. These automorphism groups have, well, so these, because being unique, these extensions are Gawa, they have Gawa group Z mod N, and I'm going to fix a coherent family of generators. So that makes KN into a difference field. A difference field is a field with a distinguished automorphism. And it begins an embedding of K into as the fixed field of some large difference field. Uh, so this is the viewpoint of differential difference fields. Um, yeah, and uh, okay. Um, what happens? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm not going to take it very far. So difference fields are very interesting, I think, in what they say about algebraic geometry. And for example, there are results of Zoe Chasidakis and myself proving uh, a question of Spiro, so an analog of Northcott's theorem about um, how many points you have of a given height in some situation in algebraic dynamics which really connects more model theories I'm going to use today that to, uh, to algebraic geometric questions, in that case, algebraic dynamics. There are many, many interesting connections, but today I'm not going to go into them at all. So even though the whole theory, um, 
Chevalier showed the whole theory works perfectly with arbitrary uh, difference equations. I'm just going to do it with algebraic equations and with equations that happens inside the KNs uh, in order to stay close to algebraic geometry, um, just for expository reasons. Okay, so, so far I gave some examples of sentences that are true in all sufficiently large finite fields. And Axe proved that, in fact, that's all, that this forms a basis of axioms. Uh, any other sentence is true in almost every large finite field, not in every large finite field, if and only it just follows logically from the ones I wrote down. Um, okay. How could he have done that? So in order to analyze all sentences, you usually need to analyze all formulas to understand what kind of sets are definable. And sometimes you're able to do that by strict quantify elimination. So definable sets are defined using quantifiers, usually many iterations of existential quantifiers and universal quantifiers. But if you can kind of nip it in the bud and show that a single quantifier doesn't do anything, that when you quantify a formula, it's equivalent to one without quantifiers. If you can do that, then of course, inductively, you can eliminate all quantifiers. And in particular, you can understand what sentences are at that point, because that is going to be equivalent to quantifier free sentences as well, along with the ones that enable the quantifier elimination. So for, for the complex numbers, you can do that. And for the real numbers, you can't because you have the projection of the parabola. So you have the formula in the variable y that says there exists x, x squared equals y, which of course says that y is positive and that's not uh, as a risky close thing to say. So you cannot eliminate it. But it turns out, and that's what Tarski showed, that, that this is all. In other words, the moment you admit this one additional predicate as um, basic somehow, as definable, all the other ones, okay. After, so after that, you have also polynomial inequalities, and that's all you need. Now, in Axe's work, these were the, were the precedents, but in his case, that's not, there's no analog of this. So you can, you still have the set of squares, which is not definable. So the set of squares in a finite field, it has, it's about half the points, and they're not definable, of course, by any polynomial equations. Uh, you need them. But if you add them to the language, it won't help with the cubic, uh, you know, the cubes. And if you add all these abelian things, it still won't help with something you can define by some non-abelian Galois extension. So you have to accept uh, a tal morphism, so to speak. So if you have a finite morphism of varieties from y to x, then you take the rational points of y and you take the image of that under f and you have to accept that that's a basic set. Um, <clears throat> okay. And in fact, there's a better point of view, which maybe is due, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, I think, uh, in addition of Mike Fried, after Axe's work, um, I'm not completely sure, but there's something called uh, Galois certification. It's connected to this point of view. And this point of view is that we're going to talk about difference varieties. So um, what is it? here's what I mean. These are the only, the only kind of different varieties that we're going to need is the one that I'm explaining here. So let's look at the map Z goes to Z squared from the multiplicative group of the field to itself. Okay, so the usual point of view when you just have varieties, well, you can take the rational points of GM and they map into the rational points of GM by the square map, but you only get about half, about half the points of the finite field are squares. And that's it, it's hard to describe this way the ones that are not squares. You can do it, but it requires an arbitrary choice of non-square in order to translate, and it's not very, it's, it's, it's a bit awkward. So the difference variety viewpoint goes like this. Instead of thinking of it as rational points, you think of the 
you're adding an equation. So now the equation of difference polynomials, they include a symbol for an automorphism. So to interpret them, you need not only a field, but a field with an automorphism and sigma is a symbol standing for that automorphism. Okay, so the difference variety is, well, you have two, you have one in which you take X not equal to zero and you say sigma of X equals X, that corresponds to GM of K. And you have one in which you say sigma squared of X equals X, so it corresponds to the quadratic extension. And you still have the map Z squared. Um, and now if, um, no, that's, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so, but within the quadratic extension, we still want to look, oh. Uh, I lost my screen now. I think you move it to another, I don't know what happened here, so. Yeah, okay. Okay, can yep. you see it? Yep, yep. Okay, okay. Um, Yeah, so if you pull back under the map sigma z squared, what happens to, what is the pullback of sigma of x equals x? Well, it splits into two difference varieties. The one that we considered earlier, sigma of x equals x, that's fine. And then there's another one, sigma of x equals minus x, which are in this case disjoint because we're in GM. And okay, and everything is covered. So you have a splitting of the pullback. And when you go forward, each one of these gives a two to one map into a half of, uh, of sigma of x equals x. Okay. So uh, with the difference varieties, they both have names. The pure variety viewpoint, you just have the squares and those elements that are not squared, squares and sometimes, and here you have, they both satisfy some equation. And more generally, so now these are all the difference varieties we're going to have to consider. So suppose you have a Galois, covering of a variety. So X is just a variety. Suppose even an etal Galois covering from Y to X. So X is Y over some group G. Um, and now if you look at the pullback of X, okay, you enrich X to a different variety by saying sigma of X equals X. So you're inside the fixed field. And if you pull back to Y, it splits into, well, the degree or cardinality of the Galois group, many different varieties that look like this. Sigma of Y is G of Y. And okay, so you get a partition of Y and it pushes forward to a partition of X. Um, here you have size of G many sets. Here you have to have the number of conjugacy classes because the, okay, the different conjugacy classes coalesce into X. Um, okay, so adding a different structure to X, even the simple one, sigma of X equals X, defines a partition, a canonical partition of both Y and on X. And this is a key point. It's going to be one of the connections to combinatorics where partitions are considered. Um, yeah, so another formulation of Axis theorem is that the theory of pseudo-finite fields, uh, the theory of all large finite fields, does eliminate quantifiers to this level, the kind of set you see in this partition, okay? The push forwards of these different varieties. Yeah, so this is, you know, to go from ordinary varieties to these different varieties is exactly the same as going from zeta functions of varieties at, to L to out in L functions of varieties. Um, to those for whom this is useful. Um, okay. Um, all right. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to discuss is the measure theory of Chatsidakis, Van der and McIntyre. So you look, we, we lost information. We used Vey's theorem, which is quantitative. It tells us that the curve has about Q points over FQ. 
but we only took so far the, the conclusion that there's one point, admittedly on an affine curve, so okay, so we can, so that's equivalent to saying the infinitely many points, as more than any finite number of points, but still not the information that there are Q points. But this quantitative aspect can be, in some sense, recaptured in the first order structure. And what you can do is to each definable set. So this is given by some formula, maybe in n variables, or maybe depending on some variety. To each such set, you can assign a dimension. That's not very complicated. You can take it to be the dimension of the zoistic closure. And you can assign a rational number, which you call the measure. And first of all, these numbers behave nicely in families. So the family will just split into two, into finitely many definable families on which these numbers are constant, the dimension and the measure are constant. And furthermore, if you take the interpretation, not in a pseudo finite, but in an actual finite field of the definable set, then in fact, the number of points will be given by a formula like Vase. So it'll be this measure times Q to the dimension plus a smaller error term. Okay. And uh, this fact extends, so already I'm going to use it for these twisted uh, finite varieties, which is already a bit more than Vase theorem, but in general, it's considerably richer, the story, and there is, uh, it is true for arbitrary difference varieties. Um, I'm just going to use it for the special ones, the cyclic ones that I mentioned before, periodic ones. Yeah, but quite recently, Volshavsky and Shudodan proved in a purely algebra geometric way, uh, the general case, the analog of the language estimates for general difference varieties, which I proved earlier by model theoretic methods. Um, yeah. Okay, now these measures, and this is are very, very simple for the difference varieties themselves. So these rational numbers that we get, we get them from the projections from y to x. If we look on y itself, we look on a difference variety. Well, this measure just gives us the number of irreducible components of maximal dimension. All this talk is by rational. So nothing I say, if you remove a proper subvariety, it's not going to change anything. I'm just working. Okay. Um, so when I say irreducible components, I'm just interested in the maximal dimensional irreducible components. And all the measure does is tell you how many there are of these irreducible components. So for an algebraic variety, it's the fact that there's no coefficient. The number of points, according to Ve, the number of points of a curve is about Q. Um, there's no coefficient. And like, likewise, for an absolutely irreducible variety. And this carries over uh, to the periodic variety. It's no longer true for general difference varieties. The story is true, but it's a bit more complicated. But for the ones I'm going to use, an irreducible difference variety has measure one. And in general, it counts irreducible components. There are many situations in algebraic geometry where the question of the number of irreducible components is much deeper than it might seem. And uh, okay, this happens here too. Um, Okay, so yeah, okay. So I'm not doing too badly. I was supposed to be here at 10 to two and I'm late by four minutes. So I'm not going to, uh, so I'm not, okay. Yeah, so I'm not going to, I'm going to skip this remark and this remark and this remark. Okay, so I'm just going to go now to a totally different chapter of semi-ready regularity. Um, yeah, let me just show, how do I do this? Okay, I'm just going to ask if there are more questions. 
Okay, so now it's a totally different beginning, and now we're in a different world of combinatorics. And when you say a graph, you mean finite graph usually. So you have finite, I'm going to look just at bipartite graphs. So you have X and Y, which are finite sets, and you have U, a subset of X times Y, and okay, so it's a graph. Um, and there's absolutely key definition of semi-ready of regularity. So I think it was, I mean, it's an unbelievable achievement, this semi-ready regularity lemma. And I think as much because of finding a definition that puts so, so much structure on a lot of combinatorics as for the proof, even though the proof was quite difficult originally. Um, so anyway, this is going to be key for the rest of this talk, the notion of regularity. And it's like this. So there's some epsilon in the combinatorial situation. There's some epsilon greater than zero given. And you say that it's epsilon regular if for every subset of A and for every subset of B, which are, well, of decent size, so they should be at least 1% of X and of Y. Hmm. If you intersect U with A times B, well, if you intersect random subsets, you expect their, the cardinality of the intersection to be the product of the cardinality is divided by the cardinality of the ambient set. And the statement of, and the definition of regularity says that this will be true up to uh, epsilon. And in all this talk, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the formulation of what up to epsilon means. You can imagine it and you can look it up. It's, uh, yeah, I'm going to say it in, at this level, uh, but I am going to say also that there's also a limit point of view in which, okay, you can just say it well, at the limit, uh, they become literally statistically independent. In other words, the expected intersection size is the intersection size. This is quite analogous to the question of, uh, properness of intersection of algebraic geometry, where you have a dimension and you expect the dimension of the intersection to be, well, you, you expect the co-dimension of the intersection to be the sum of the co-dimensions. It's the same here if you use log of cardinality, uh, to, you think of it as a dimension. Okay, so regular, so this is about the notion of proper intersections and regular means um, you have a binary set. So it's a subset of the product X times Y, and it has no positive correlation with any unary sets. If you take just a subset of X and a subset of Y, there's no correlation between U and A times B. So um, yeah, so it's purely binary. That's how I think it's good to think of it. Um, Sometimes it's called things like random or quasi-random. And it's true in one sense, it's not true in another sense. It's true in the sense that if you try to guess if a pair X, Y lies in U um, by properties of X and properties of Y, you will have no chance. I mean, there'll be, there'll be no, you, you, You'll, you'll just have absolutely no information just from individual properties of X and of Y, X in A and Y in B. So it's random in that sense, but it doesn't need to be at all random as a binary relation. For example, the Paley graph is defined like this. So U is the set of all, so U is the set of all pairs X, Y, such that the difference between them is a square. This can be defined in FQ. And that is, um, it's regular, it's a regular graph. It becomes in fact more and more regular as Q becomes bigger and bigger. So epsilon would be, I don't know, one over Q to the one half or something. Um, and of course it's not random at all. I just wrote a formula for it, but it's random in this sense, in the unary sense. Um, Okay, so that's an example of regularity. Here's a non-example that you, the same equation, but multiplicative. So there exists, so X times Y is a square. And of course here, well, there is a correlation between properties of X and Y, namely, if these are the squares in X, 
uh, and these are the squares in Y, then all of them are correlated. And all the non-squares are correlated to each other as well. So, right, so because their product will be a square in a finite field, but there will be no correlations between squares and non-squares and vice versa. So here the situation is totally unary, actually. There's a unary partition, a partition here and a partition here, which totally kills the graph. I mean, so it becomes, yeah. Okay, so this is exactly the opposite case from regularity. And by the way, if you try to think of an algebraic geometric difference between this equation and that equation, it's not immediately obvious, right? I mean, both of them give, they're not, it's not a question of, yeah, maybe the, yeah, on GM, so they're both just curves, um, both irreducible. So in order to see, there's a different notion of uh, irreducibility going on here, which is a bit less known than the usual notion of irreducibility, and I'm going to get to it. Um, okay, and here's Samuel Eddy's lemma. So it says, every finite graph can be partitioned. Okay, so you can partition the x's and partition the y's and just look at the graph restricted to each of these peers. Okay, well, it's actually going to be to most of these peers in the general situation. For us, it's going to be all of them very soon, but uh, okay. In Semele's lemma, it's just most of them. But anyway, uh, you look at the restricted graphs. Um, oh, yeah. So you can partition them once and for all into a bounded number of uh, subgraphs such that, uh, yeah, okay. I, Yeah, such that each one of these is regular. Okay, so in the two examples that I had before, the second example, you would need to partition into the squares and non-squares, the X and the Y. And here you don't, and each one of these would be regular. Here you didn't need to partition, it was already regular. Okay, so there, I mean, so it's a, so it's a very fundamental theorem and there are many, many proofs, the original proof of Samoredi, and then proofs using, well, he was just working hands-on as I understand with graphs combinatorially, but people did it with other tools, um, Schuttenberg with dynamical systems. And uh, the proof I'm going to sketch for you is, I, I learned it from Tausner, following some other proofs, but anyway, I think it's a very, very simple one. Um, now it involves, it gives a conceptual proof. It doesn't aim for the best bounds. It aims for a conceptual explanation. And in order to do this, we start with our family of finite graphs and we try to compactify it. We try to find some class that has a compactness theorem. So, well, first order class will have a compactness theorem and which, in which this can be formulated. If we can do that, and if we can show the Semere dilemma just individually for each graph in the family, not worrying about a bound to the size of the partitions, then by compactness, there will be a bound automatically. Now, of course, that's not true if you just start with a family of all finite graphs. And of course, each one individually, you can just partition into singletons and it's trivially regular. But if you do that in a compact setting, then uh, you are done. So the part of it is to compactify. And here's the answer. This is the correct compactification. You need some first order setting in which you can formulate the statement. So you just take the triples X, Y, U, which have given measures on X, on Y, and on X times Y. And then you will be able to formulate the question because you will be able to talk about the correlation between U and measurable subsets of X and of Y. And okay, the correlation between the binary set U and unary set. So this is what you need, X, Y, U, and the me a measure algebra on X, a measure algebra on Y, a measure algebra on the product. Um, okay, that's the class. Now these, okay, you can take 
this one has a compactness principle. You can take all the products, you can take weak limits of measure, or you can, take, you can do trees in various ways. Now you might ask, why do I need a measure on X times Y? If I have a measure on X and the measure of Y, I just take the product measure. Yes, but that's not the right, that is not preserved under limits. In other words, in each finite graph X and Y, the measure, so it's just the counting measure on the product is just the product of the counting measures. But to decompose, let's say, if X equals Y, the diagonal, it takes you more and more little rectangles as the size of X grows, right? I mean, the diagonal is not really a product of, it's not, it's, it's hard to express it in terms of rectangles, except by the cardinality of the, of the graph. Okay. So at the limit, you're going to get different measure algebras. The measure algebra on X times Y is going to be strictly bigger than the product measure algebra. Okay, so this is the problem. That's why there's something to prove, essentially. But then you notice that the question is about the correlation of something, of you, but with A times B, with something which is just by definition inside uh, the product algebra. And therefore, when you're comparing with something in the product algebra, you can project to that. You can take the conditional probably the conditional expectation of you in this smaller product algebra. Or if you prefer to work with L2 with Hilbert spaces, you take L2 of X times Y and you project to L2 of X tensor L2 of Y to this closed subspace. Okay, so there's a little bit more to do there because you just get a measurable function on X times Y but then you can approximate it by step functions and you're very clear. Okay, then it becomes quite uh, much clearer what you're supposed to do once you know this structure. Okay, um, so I wanted to give this sketch of proof in order to stress what's at stake. And again, what's at stake is that we have different algebras on uh, X times Y as opposed to what we get just from X and just from Y. And of course, in algebraic geometry, it's the most everyday experience. There's a risky topology, for example, on X times Y. It's, it's nothing to do with the one on X and on Y. You get many more closed sets. It's similar. Right. Um, that was Semery's theorem. And it was almost an equally uh, difficult, non-trivial step to extend it to higher dimensions. So it was due independently, as far as I understand, to Gowers and uh, Rödel, Skokan. And I'll just, there's a really a luminous article of uh, uh, Gowers from 2005 or six uh, explaining it. And he also explained this just for n equals three. I'll just explain it here for n equals three. Um, right, so now we have a subset of x1 times x2 times x3. And you can consider the projections to each pairs. And now you're interested in to what extent we seem to have a ternary relation. And I would like to say that it's regular if you cannot get it by any binary relations. In particular, for example, it's not a conjunction of just something you can say about PS from X1 times X2 and something you can say about PS from X1 times X3 and something from X2 times X3, it's different. It's, it's essentially ternary. That's what regular means. So you look at the projections to the various pairs and you say that it's regular, again, if for any choice of subsets, A, I, J, including X, I, J, uh, if you like the limit or up to epsilon, I'm not even writing this epsilon now. Um, anyway, U is an independent, if you think of it as an event, uh, to say that x1, x2, x3 belongs to you is statistically independent from this conjunction of statements that, from any conjunction of statements about what happens to peers. You do, you have to assume, do you have to assume that A is sufficiently large? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, A, I just, so I have the say, I said I wasn't mentioning the epsilons anymore, but yeah. So yeah, as before, Aij should be greater than or equal to epsilon times uh, Xij or something like this. Yes, um, or, or that it, yeah. 
uh, or if you go to the limit, then uh, then okay, if they're not, then it becomes a zero event, and most likely it's independent for anything. But uh, yeah, but you need to assume it. And independent in the finite situation, it's only independent up to epsilon. It takes it takes some formulation. Yeah, but okay. At the limit, like I said, with the proof of uh, Semmelius theorem, it's exactly this. So the projection of the characteristic function of u from L2 of the product space to the sum of the L2 spaces of the binary product spaces um, is, is uh, it's orthogonal to that. Um, one, once you yeah, normalize it's orthogonal to that. Okay. Okay, and again, you have Samaritan's theory, Samaritan's lemma, Samaritan, the higher dimensional Samaritan theorem by these people. So first of all, any U contained in the triple can be partitioned to regulars. And what does it mean partitioned? Well, the, we're partitioning the pairs now. So we are, we are being given, uh, it's not the single XIs which are being partitioned, it's uh, the different pairs. Okay, so that's one part of the theorem and it works against different, okay, so then once, okay, in the definition of regular also, yeah, the opponent was allowed to give you AIJ, which are completely arbitrary subsets of the pairs. Okay, and the second statement which comes out and maybe it was also implicit in the way Samaradi was using his theorem for N equals two, but it was much harder to achieve for higher N um, so the two fundamental statements, the one is this finiteness statement that you can make a single two partition, which such that after that, it will be unrelated to any other two partition. And the second is a characterization, and I wrote it here, that the correlation with any relation of binary origin is controlled by binary self-correlations. So let me explain that. So consider the self-correlation. So you take the, the ambient universe is x1 times x2 times x3. You take that squared. You take two copies of that. That has projections to x1 times x2, x3, but it has actually eight such projections because you have two copies of x1. So you have two projections from, from x1 squared to x1, two projections from x2 squared to x2, and two from x3 squared to x3, and then you can just vary your choices and you get eight projections from here to here. So you get eight pullbacks of u, pi new universe of u. And regularity is equivalent to the fact that all these things are statistically independent. So again, if you're doing it with epsilons up to epsilon up to epsilon, or if you're doing it limit, just statistically independent. Okay, so it's, so it's fantastic. I mean, first of all, it means that if it's regular, then you can do counting very well. You can take intersections of various events and do your counting all the six tuples X with certain properties, you can count. But conversely, that if you can count one thing, well, Gauss somehow combines it into a single expression, say a single linear combination of these which suffices. Anyway, if you can count just these uh, a finite number of events, if you can count their intersections, and if their intersections are as you would expect, then it's regular. Okay, the proof is actually not so long. Uh, it's so Gauss applies n times, three times in this case, uh, some kind of Cauchy Schwarz, but uh, okay, but, but it's a fantastic uh, statement. Uh, well, now it was supposed to be two or five. Um, okay, so I just gave the two chapters. Are the questions? Okay, so now just putting them together to say it is simple. The, the proof was quite rich, but uh, um, anyway, uh, to say, I'm going to say it, yeah, so this is what Tao did. He did it for the original Samaritan setting. So he just takes the Samaritan dilemma, but with the additional information that U is definable in pseudo-finite fields. Um, 
And the statement is the same, that there exists a partition, but now this partition is also definable. And there's no longer this 99% business. So this is a second thing that you have all pairs become regular. But second of all, this regularity becomes uh, exponentially better as you take a better uh, finite field, a larger finite field. And this really is a game changer. So it's not, you know, to know, because then you really know um, the, the correct, you really know the measure to uh, asymptotically. It's not the same at all as knowing it up to multiplication by 1.1. It's really a different story. But it, when uh, you say exponentially, it means up to some inverse powers of q. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I forgot now, but yeah, maybe q to the, yeah. Yeah. Q to the minus one quarter, maybe. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is the statement. And okay, so tau goes further than that. I'll say it very quickly, but in the way that I stated regularity, it actually makes sense even when age itself is not is sparse. And he shows a kind of regularity even for hypersurfaces. Uh, yeah, but then it's not it's not true without exceptions. There are exceptions. But the exceptions all come from, in this given situation, abelian groups. Uh, I'm not going to, to get to this. Uh, something like this was proved by Elikas Sabo in the characteristic zero case, and Tao was able to prove it uh, uh, for finite fields. And here it's quite important that the challenges should still be pretty big. Actually, Tao gets better than this but at least you can do this. Um, okay, so I'm not going to discuss this, but I'm just, I just want to say that uh, there's more in Tao's paper. Um, yeah, okay, so for him, if you apply what I just said for the graph of polynomial, uh, just a polynomial map, uh, it's the same as saying expansion, that whenever you take, uh, subsets uh, x1, x2, well, let's say that each one of them has size at least one over a hundred of the whole field, then applying the binary map will just give you everything. Um, okay, that's why his paper is called something with polynomial expansion. Okay, and this, uh, but, uh, okay. Yeah. Suppose yeah. you take h is a product. If take square x1 square and x2 square, no, the product so, is square. Yeah. yeah, then you're falling into the exceptions. So where do they say it? Yeah. So for this hypersurface story, there do exist exceptions, and a part of the story is to recognize them. So yeah, if things come from an an abelian group, uh, it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, but it's, yeah, so recognition is part of the story of that. But yeah, but so I'm not, but I'm not going there. I'm going to the place where the definable, uh, the regular thing is also of the order of my, of the dimension of the Indian space. The same, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just pointing out here this remarkable thing that even though he managed to get a definable partition, it would already be an achievement to get a definable partition which is regular against all further definable partitions. But that's not the statement. You make the partition definable, but then it works against arbitrary challenges. If you choose a completely arbitrary subset in XI of FQ, still going to be uncorrelated with you. Um, okay. Okay, but uh, as Tao points out himself, he only does it for unary challenges. He only looks at correlation with subsets of Xi, not with what Gowers did, not with, uh, not with subsets of Xi times Xj. So he formulates this question. And this is what uh, I left space to write, but I don't have time. Um, okay, so this is what uh, uh, Elad and Alex did and uh, um, in an ad statement, this, he obtained exactly Tau's statement, 
but it only worked for 99% of the primes, not for all primes. And in Alex's statement, the result works for all primes, but the statement needs to be changed. But it's really not a disadvantage because the change is, I think, very interesting. Um, so what I'm going to do now, so this is the fourth section, I'm going to describe the um, statements of uh, higher regularity in this definable setting. And for this, you have to recall the ideology of a tal anything, a tal cohomology or a tal homotopy or something that open sets don't actually have to be sets. They can be, so a neighborhood can be just a map into X, not necessarily a subset of X. So you have to convert the notion of a graph of you contained in X times Y to the notion of a map from you into X times Y. And for us, it's going to be uh, finite maps. So uh, if you want, you can think of A contained in, but contained not necessarily in X, but in some Italian neighborhood of X, X tilde maps to X. And here's the theorem that uh, if you start with a definable, uh, let's say ternary uh, relation U, then um, maybe I should do it. Okay. Then there exists, first of all, you have to take an etal covering. And after that, so, okay, so you cover Xi by Xi tilde, and then you cover Xi tilde times Xj tilde, but by Xij tilde, these are finite morphisms. And you have to take the definable partition here of the Xij tilde into uh, regular systems. Wait, how does, what? Um, okay, this, and this is something that Alex discovered. So this allows an improvement. So now we don't have to talk about definable sets. Since we're anyway going to a tal cover, we can just partition by difference varieties. And then the measure theory becomes very, very simple because as we said, the measure of a difference variety is just the number of irreducible components. So you achieve the statement again with the same improved, uh, well, qualitatively improved uh, quantitative part. Um, yeah. Now, so this statement seems different because you have to go to a tal covers in the definable setting, that's what you get. But if somehow you are given sections, let's say just purely combinatorially after you specialize to a finite field, if somehow you're given sections which break the tal cover, then you recover the usual combinatorial partition but with the same advantages, but in particular, uh, the regularity improves with Q. Okay, so that's the statement. And now I'm going to, so the fifth part, forget about all these things. Now I'm just going to give an analog on the right-hand side here. I'm going to give a purely algebra geometric analog of regularity, not regularity itself, which is inspired by this previous statement. Um, but later we're going to see that it actually implies it as well. But here I'm going to formulate it just with varieties. So, okay. So the analog of a subset is a finite uh, Galois cover of varieties. The analog of statistical independence is Galois independence. I'll say it in a minute what it means exactly. And regularity is the analog of that. What is regularity? you say that U is essentially binary. So here you have a covering of X times Y, and you say that this covering cannot be found by coverings of X and Y alone. So for any, so now A is another variety, and for any covering by, of, of X by A and of Y by B, if you take the fiber product uh, with A times B, it's just, it stays irreducible. So you can't, in particular, it's not equal to you, for example, you cannot reach you this way. But furthermore, since these are normal, you can say that the Gala groups are uh, destroying someone from each other. Um, okay. Yeah, so this is a statement of Samurai dilemma that for any U finite map into X times Y, you can once and for all, this is the finiteness, 
you can once and for all so called partition X, in other words, find a finite cover of X and partition Y in the same sense. And then you have to go to the components as varieties of this fiber product, and then it's regular. So this is a finite statement, this summary dilemma. After some decomposition, further decompositions can't hurt you. And you have a similar statement for any end. Uh, okay. Now, yeah, so I'll just point out that there's a bit of luck with the terminology. If n equals one, so I'm going now below Samarides level to, to n equals one. So we just have one variety over a field. Uh, what does it mean to say that a cover of it is regular? So u by definition should be irreducible over k. And regular means it has nothing to do with extensions at level n minus one. So that means you take a finite extension of the field itself and you take a product with that and u stays irreducible. So actually this, so, so now we found uh, the usual notion of absolute irreducibility, which also algebraically says that the function field k of u is a regular extension of k of x. So actually the n regular, so the regular notion is actually compatible. Um, okay, so I wrote it uh, more precisely for, uh, for the general n case. Okay, so now so we really have to talk about systems of varieties, not single varieties. So they're indexed by subsets of all the elements from one to n. This is the analog of what we saw that when we have a graph containing x times y times z, we have to consider the projections to x times y to y times z and so on. Um, so you have such a system of varieties with, in particular, you have finite maps from let's say x one, two, three to x one times x two times x three. And regular means that if you try to base change this system by some other system, which only uses the indices of size less than n, you, it stays irreducible. You cannot touch it. it stays with the same Galois group after the base change. Um, and you also have the analog. So this is needs proof. It's not so difficult to prove that uh, the finiteness that there exists a semi partition. And the finiteness statement, would, the second statement, sorry, the Gower's uh, Redelskokan analog. Um, again, you take the two to the n possible projections of the set at level n to the doubled system, right? So you can project x1 to the, this x1 and then x2 to that x2 and you have to do the n choices. And for each, you have pullbacks and now they're finite covers. They're not, uh, they're finite Galois covers. Well, taking the um, fiber product of all these remains, um, yeah. Uh, so within, within the fiber product of all these extensions, all these different pullbacks uh, the intersections are proper intersections with irreducible uh, result. Okay, so this is the kind of, so this irreducibility of the intersections is the analog, irreducibility in the top dimension is the analog of uh, statistical independence. Um, okay, right. So maybe I have time in two minutes to explain. So that was the algebraic geometric statement and it just mentioned varieties, but now in order to deduce from it the Tau, Levy, uh, Chevalier statement, uh, you need all the previous components that I mentioned, in particular the difference varieties and the measures. Um, so let me just do it for the case N equals two. So, um, Okay, so we start with um, right. So we start just with a regular extension in the algebra geometric sense. U goes to x times y. Let's start with that. So it's a Galois covering, which we assume is regular. Automatically, 
you're going to get a partition into different varieties of the kind that I, that, uh, I discussed earlier. So you say sigma of x equals g of x, this kind of thing. So you have the vi's uh, which uh, partition uh, u. And then let's just look at one of them, v. And now the statement is that the map from this v, so now the v is a definable set, it's no longer a variety, it's a, it's a difference variety. And now we specialize to q and we, did, we interpret this over the q element field. And the statement is that this is regular uh, in the combinatorial sense. And this amounts to saying that the four different, so okay, so now I'm going to use the second equivalence according to Bowers. And so we have four pullbacks of this V uh, into, well, into the full fiber product over X1 times X2 times X3 times X4. And we have to show statistical independence for the CDM measures. So this we can actually do at a different level before specializing to Q, but CDM guaranteed to us that when we do specialize to Q, we're going to have statistical independence in the usual sense. Okay, now discover by all the UIJs uh, has got all the different four doublings. This has Gala group G to the fourth, uh, right? So this you want to somehow maps to this and then so on. Um, and therefore, when you split it into different varieties, it's not irreducible. It's a measure of space of size g to the fourth. And inside that measure space, each of the irreducible uh, difference varieties, um, over whatever it sits, it has measure one. And okay, in the other components, it has measure g to the power of three, uh, of two. So, Okay, so you, you know all the measures very precisely and, you, and, it, and it's just trivial to see that in fact, you have statistical independence. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, yeah, so a kind of apology. So I made an algebraic geometric statement that immediately gives the generalized tau theorem, but actually the only proof I know at this moment of the algebraic geometric statement uses uh, a kind of analytic cauchy schwarz analog of Gower's uh, due to Alex. So um, I, I can see a direct proof for n equals two, and I believe that you, there exist also algebraic geometric proofs. But um, David Kashdan and Tammy Ziegler have found areas which are not identical to this, uh, but quite similar in which they prove algebra geometric statements that are not so easy to prove without going through uh, Gower's uh, norms and associated theory. I think it's not the case here. I think you can do it, but we'll see. Um, yeah, okay, just a remark towards the future that currently this applies to questions like definable sets. It means questions like, is the square root in the field or isn't it in the field? But actually, you can ask other questions taking this quantity and applying an additive character. So you can even ask, these are called phase polynomials, or you can apply the additive character to the square root of f if it happens to be in the field. And I don't know, but I just want to say that all the ingredients for the generalization are available. Uh, I'm quite optimistic that it can be generalized. Yeah, and this I've mentioned before, I don't think it's the same. So I think that the kajdan siegler theory has an additional aspect that it's not based on the theory of pseudo-finite fields, actually. It's based on an infinite dimensional theory when you have both a field and an infinite dimensional vector space and some ability to take multilinear maps up to some degree. And the model theory of this has not been worked out. The closest we have for D equals two is by Jan Dubovolsky. And uh, we know that it's going to be not simple theory from all of theories, but an ends of one theory. And okay, it'll be very nice uh, to pursue this, but at the moment this is, uh, yeah, I think in that direction, there's something else which is completely open. Okay, so I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. Yeah, thanks very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Udi. Thank you very much for a great talk, very inspirational. Let's thank uh, Udi for a very good talk. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, please uh, ask questions. Mm -hmm. If anyone has a question, just uh, type in the chat or just tell, just, just better ask in person. Okay, maybe let me stop recording. Uh, it's easier.